And every time something comes up, like VR technology, they're like, well, what's an existing thing? And we'll make a digital version of it. And that's always not what it's good at. We've come up with this clever idea with machine learning, and it seems to me like this will work like really, really well. And it seems like so obvious, like, hasn't somebody done this already? And like, it's kind of just genius. And won't that be exactly what you want? And isn't this like a perfect candidate? And Andrew goes, oh yeah, we're in the popcorn era. And I'm like, sorry, what? And he's like, yeah, there are all these kernels that are gonna pop. They just haven't popped yet, right? But like, they're so obvious that they're gonna pop and you just have to find out whether they're popped yet or not. They haven't popped yet, pop them because they're gonna pop, right? I absolutely think that you should own your own data and you should have control over who uses your data and what you do. Uh, in another, so that's, I am completely support the artist. But I will say this, if you post stuff into an environment where it says this is publicly available for anyone to reference, then that's what they're going to do. And I think part of the problem is there was a naivety over what people were doing when they were giving their content to platform sites. This kind of ties into an episode that I recorded previously, so it'll probably come out slightly before this one. We were talking about the no AI thing that's happened on ArtStation. And so what I guess, coming back to your early point about respect, is the data sets themselves and the inference, how important is the originality or the ownership of the data set when it comes to then owning the inference of that data set? I guess there's at two levels. Like at one level, um, I absolutely think that you should own your own data and you should have control over who uses your data and what you do. Uh, in another, so that's, I completely support the artist. But I will say this, if you post stuff into an environment where it says this is publicly available for anyone to reference, then that's what they're gonna do. And I think part of the problem is there was a naivety over what people were doing when they were giving their content to platform sites. Like platform sites, be it Facebook, be it YouTube, whatever, like they are, they are making money from you by selling your data effectively, right? And in it, I'm sorry, but it's just naive to think that you can upload all these videos and all this stuff to a site, not be charged a cent, and somebody is gonna provide that service and not somehow make money from it. And so there is a prevailing view, like, well, that's all mine. I'm like, well, okay, if it's all yours, don't give it away for free. And if you're gonna give it away for free and provide it to a platform, then just be aware that's what you're doing. And then people are going to use that. Like that is the price you pay for. So if I post a whole bunch of stuff to Facebook, the price I pay is not a monthly fee to Facebook. It's the fee of them using my data about me, my heuristics, my whatever. So you can't have your cake and eat it too. Um, so if I post, like we post a lot of stuff to FX Guide and we own it. We don't post all that stuff just free to every other site um, because then they'd own it, right? Or at least they'd have, you know, you can't come to FX Guide and take our stuff because we own it and it's on our site. Now, if you scrape our site, um, then there are, you get into fair use. And if you get into fair use, you're now in a really interesting area because here's the thing, if I was talking to you about a shot, right? Like imagine we're in a brilliant world where you're, I'm lucky enough to have you as my uh, my visual effects team, right? And I say to you, okay, this opening shot, what I'm looking at is, and I used this example the other day with somebody else, like it's a David Lynch shot in a Pixar style. Like I want like this Pixar-esque David Lynch shot uh, kind of out in the kind of canyons, wild uh, kind of Arizona space, right? Okay, so in that sentence, unpack that, right? I've said Arizona and you're thinking, okay, well, I've seen shots of Arizona. Maybe you haven't been to Arizona, but you've definitely seen photos of it and you've got an idea what that looks like. David Lynch. So now I'm communicating camera angle, where the frame is, wide angle, low angle, blah, blah, blah. And Pixar, a particular style of 3D, um, you know, great high quality, blah, blah, blah. But you're referencing three different groups of stuff to get the visual picture of what I'm talking about. And we call that respectful. We don't call that disrespectful. It's not like people would say, oh my God, I can't believe. Mm. Like in the, in the new Avatar 
film, I think it was. It was one of the Bake Off films. They were, you know, quite openly and happily saying, oh, this shot, the uh, robots are coming out of the thing. And, uh, and it was a very, like, Terminator 2 reference. Now, in the case of Avatar, it's a director referencing his own work, right? So, <laughs> but my point is, no one said, oh, my God, I can't believe that you cheated because it's a completely new shot in every respect. It's just at best an homage and... Or you could just argue it's a really good digital shorthand, a verbal shorthand for what you want to digitally, right? Um, so when I talk to you about that shot, the David Lynch, Arizona Pixar thing, it's just shorthand and it lets you reference and build up a mental picture of what I'm talking about. And we do that all the time. And when I'm talking to script writers, I remember talking to a script writer, it's really good. And I was like, you know, I'm not a script writer. I do write a lot, but I'm not a script writer. And it's like the number one thing he would say to young script writers is read lots of scripts. Just immerse yourself in scripts because you learn from them and then you get better. But you don't steal from them. That would be wrong. But you definitely learn from them. So now let's move that into machine learning terms. Like, is it wrong that the machine looked at a lot of David Lynch films, looked at a lot of Pixar films and looked at a lot of photos of Arizona to come up with an inferred image of what a Arizona outside exterior shot would look like if it was in a David Lynch style and a Pixar style. And most people would be like, well, uh, uh. but I'm like, that's totally what humans do. Um, and we applaud it, right? We say, you know, if you want to be a good artist, go to the Louvre and sit there and look at all these great masters on the wall and just look at how they use light. Like anyone who's a lighting artist will tell you that they'll stand there in front of Monet's haystacks and go, oh my God, look at how you've got this uh, color in the shadows. Like he's captured the bounce light and the, the tones in the shadows and, the, and it's tempered with the sky colors influencing it. And a, and a good lighting artist will look at the haystack shot by Monet and just totally learn about how that produces really beautiful shadows and lighting things. And they're not stealing from Monet and they're not being disrespectful to Monet mm -hmm. in doing that. Um, so I don't think it's a simple answer. Uh, I do, as I say, think that you shouldn't have your work taken from you and, and used commercially without your permission. But if you go and post a ton of stuff to a platform site that's going to make money from that uh, and they, they don't charge you and, you know, it's not like, a, then you're kind of like, well, what did you think that they were going to do? You know what I mean? Like these are not charities these are like commercial mega corporations there's an element of the, the terms of conditions these very long terms of conditions that can be quite confusing and and we have had cases where people you know have been refunded on missold and in, in england you get phoned up all the time if you've been missold ppe which was this payment protection insurance that a lot of the credit card companies sort of upsold to customers and even though people signed for that and agreed to it um, the, the the fundamental law was that they, they they would be refunded on that because it was not what they expected it to be because people might expect their image to be appearing in different places but they might not expect well, now, their entire style to be taken yeah but that's the point though isn't it the the current laws discuss taking your material and directly using it the current laws be them right or wrong do not give you copyright over a style. If I come up with a new style, like there's another example, right? It's maths. Like you can't copyright maths. If I come up with an equation, you can't copyright that, right? Um, the classic example was some dude worked out, I was like either tides or celestial charts or some darn thing back in the, in the you know, I'm talking like pre-World War II. And it was a lifetime thing to produce this book of stuff that every naval cadet had to buy because they needed it for doing, you know, old school navigation before there were satellites, right? And then some American guy just republished it all in America and they couldn't sue him because it was just numbers and numbers can't be copyrighted. And so the only thing that they could do is that the British Navy insisted on only buying the British version and not the American version, even though the American <laughs> version was cheaper because there was no law that stopped you doing that. So if I come up with a really great equation... It's just not under the law copyrightable. It's not possible for you to copyright style. It is wrong and unethical and disrespectful to impersonate somebody 
or to imitate their style as if to pass yourself off or your work off as theirs or even their involvement in your work, right? Don't get me wrong, I'm totally against any of that. But like who hasn't stylistically done, and, and then there is homages and then there's parodies, like it's a very complicated and nuanced area. Um, yeah, I just, I guess for me, I, I fall a bit more heavily in the uh, stuff is going to be referenced. And also when you get to art, it gets even more complicated because people say, oh, well, that wasn't done by the artist. Um, that was just created by them typing some crap into a, uh, you know, a, a stable diffusion program. And that's not art. And I'm like, Andy Warhol didn't produce a lot of Andy Warhols when he was making them at the factory in New York, right? He would get other people to actually make the Andy Warhols, the screen prints. Um, and, you know, the manual dexterity of doing something isn't actually the criteria of art. So there are lots of instances where artists have other people make their art, especially sculptors. Sculptors will often commission the art, design the art, but they'll actually have a team of other people actually make the darn things. And so it's, an, it's a romanticized view of art that the artist has an innate uh, mechanical, physical ability to produce something that is intrinsically the art. That's not art, that's craft you have a craft at being able to do something like I might have the craft of being able to paint in a certain way. The art isn't the craft. They're two separate things. And the art is detached, which is why you have concept art, which is, and I mean by this, like a conceptual artist, right? In, you know, and why somebody might like Duchamp back in, you know, early part of the 20th century does the, um, the, the urinal, for example, right? Which is like the ready-mades and he does a bicycle wheel on a stool and like now where's the manual dexterity in that or where is the craft in that it's like there's, there's no it's no craft in them he signs the urinal and sticks it on a and it's so i mean it's like one of the most valuable pieces of modern art right it's extraordinarily it's not because it's artistically exceptional and it's not because there's a lot of craft in it it's the concept of the ready-made and seeing art in everyday items that is the artistic component of that, which is also the artistic component of a Campbell soup by Warhol. Um, and you go to Jackson Pollock and you're like, the guy is some drunk throwing paint at a canvas. How can that be anything, right? Um, in Australia, we bought blue poles in like the 1970s, that piece of art, like I'm gonna say late 70s, for like about a million dollars. Today, it's worth like half a billion. I'm reading the argument, um, which is both my previous guest, Alvaro Garcia Martinez, and and also the legal case that's being put forward, like Carla Ortez and some other people. Um, and reading some of the case document, their proposed their their description of stable diffusion is as a digital collage. So they're looking at it as being very similar to a DMP artist who might be taking pictures off the internet, but if they're if they're um, freed for commercial use. Um, that's one thing, but if they're not, you would still be in breach of copyright potentially, even though you are obviously completely changing that image because you're taking this mountain and it's no longer this photo of the Alps, but it's a, a fantasy mountain in, in uh, Middle Earth. So collage is a valid form of art. Of course. Um, and under copyright laws, a significantly... Um, I've forgotten the exact word. It's like transformed uh, or transformative piece of stuff is a, is a separate copyright and separate art, which otherwise, if you didn't have that, you couldn't sample uh, in music. So there's just two issues here, right? Like, is it fair? Is it, and is it uh, legal? And I'm not a lawyer, so I can't comment on the legality of it. I don't know that the law is always in sync with my opinion of what the law should do, but I totally respect the law. The question is, is the work that we're discussing respectful to the artist? And in some cases it isn't, and in many cases it is. Um, but, you know, I, I just have a personal opinion, and my personal opinion is that you need to be respectful to the artist, but at some point also, you can't throttle artistic 
processes by saying nobody can reference previous art like that would be horrendous to if you had a legal impediment to people referencing other people's art that would be a horrendous impediment to the uh advancement of art full stop just horrendous right it's like like i tell you the, the same thing is you know when computers came out secretaries lost their jobs in one sense right because you just need a secretary to type stuff up right like it's really miserable if you're the secretary but the advantages as a whole were huge. So it's really crap if you aren't making money off people that are referencing your art. Like I wish that you were making money off them, but it may be that the price of fixing that is actually, for me, a societal price too high to pay. In other words, if we were to fix the problem that everybody got paid for anyone referencing their art, while I see a at the individual level, that might be good for the individual. It would be horrendous for um, society. But I don't want people just to be ripped off in their work and people to pass off, uh, you know, work as like somebody else's work or devalue their work. But at the end of the day, um, what makes something valuable isn't just, as I say, like the kind of the making of it. That's not what, like art is different from craft. I can just keep coming back to that. Absolutely. And the other thing, this is rolling back quite a way, but it, I picked it up and then obviously we had a lot of interesting discussions um, on a slightly different point, but you mentioned VR and obviously your role in VR as well and your role in many humans and about the more tech is better. And I don't know if you saw this demo. Did you ever see the Walmart demo of their metaverse implementation? But there was some... I don't think so. So it's a digital shopping, um, replacing a website shopping, basically, your online shopping. Although, weirdly, at the end, it says, we'll pack the stuff into your car, which means presumably this person is doing the VR of Walmart from the Walmart car park, which seems like a bizarre choice. But um, you walk around the Walmart, and it had lots of things that I just thought were... For example, you would pick up the milk and you would put it in your trolley. So you'd put your virtual milk in your virtual trolley and if you just changed your mind, you actually had to take the virtual milk out of your trolley and put it back into the virtual fridge. Whereas you're thinking, well, I'm in a virtual world. Why can't I just throw it to the side? I mean, you're making it, you're, you're giving me this slow digital um, technology. But at the same time, I've got all of the disadvantages of actually being in Walmart. I can't just throw the milk away when I don't want it. I have to put it back in the fridge carefully <laughs> via this VR. Um, and it just seemed, I, I don't know, uh, th there are, you can sort of see what use cases there are, all the kind of virtual meetings where you have people in a meeting room, but they're looking at a PowerPoint presentation. And then you're wondering why, why are they doing that? I mean, I'm 100% I'm with you, right? Like, <clears throat> but the problem that highlights, isn't it, I believe, is that when people are trying to come up with things to do with new tech, they just tend to extrapolate from where they are right now. So if you looked at the first sort of movie TV show stuff that were based on radio plays, it was like, hey, the radio play is the thing that works. And so we're going to add vision. So we're almost going to effectively film the radio play, right? And, uh, and if we're going to, or we'll put, uh, you know, like they used to call them like the, whatever it was, the Colgate Theatre, because they were like, well, we've gone from the theatre to television. So we should just have a, you know, in their case, a televised theatre. And then we did the same thing with digital. Like it was like, oh, well, we're going to digitize this process. So what we're going to do is take the brochure that you used to make and put it online. And now you'll have an online brochure. And, you know, what are you going to use a computer for? Well, uh, you'll have a cookbook electronically and you'll have your computer in the kitchen. And then you'll be able to, you know, go off the, the cooking uh, instructions on your computer, which is just mad, right? Because back in the day, computers cost a bomb and they were enormous and you're never going to put one in a kitchen. And, you know, like setting up a computer would take somebody like a half an hour and the thought that you would dismantle your Apple IIe and lug it into your kitchen and sort of switch it all on and then like run the risk of it getting wet is just absurd, right? But that's what people do, right? And so the internet comes along, they do the same thing again, like with, you know, and every time something comes up, like VR technology, they're like, well, what's an existing thing? And we'll make a digital version of it. And that's always not what it's good at. So you didn't make money from making a digital book, 
I mean, some people did, right? But like that wasn't the purpose of the internet. Why the internet blew up and went insanely and made billionaires was from platforms. Like I'm not going to make any videos. Like web TV came along, I think from Microsoft and died when they were going to basically make a TV channel on the web. And nobody wanted to do that, right? It just didn't work. But YouTube comes along and says, we're not going to make any content. We're just going to let you upload your videos to this site, but we're just going to get a platform. And now it's the second most viewed website in the world. And obviously one of the most valuable properties in the internet. Now, of course, you know, over time, YouTube people may make YouTube videos, but like it's a minor part of their business, right? Um, so, so with the VR stuff and with AR, a lot of this stuff happens. Like, so your example of Walmart, it's just mad, right? It's just nuts. The only reason that you might want to do something like that <clears throat> is if the people that you're initially trying to appeal to are so technologically inept that they would have trouble with a different mental model. So when we're doing user interface design, we often talk about what is my mental model as the designer and what is my user's mental model? And I need to have a matching mental model. And so if my mental model is Amazon, where you just delete something out of your cart when you don't need it anymore, and they can have that mental model easily understood, then they just delete it out of their cart and the milk is back in the notional digital fridge, right? But if they can't get that concept of, and they can't have that mental model, then you have to go to the only model that they can work with, which is a traditional cart in a traditional Walmart and then they put it back on the shelf. Now, I think that is probably why they did that, but I have no basis in fact for saying that. But if it is the case, then you're really assuming that your potential Walmart shopper is a moron, right? Because in the modern world, who the heck doesn't understand deleting something from the cart doesn't, you know, and it's digital inventory anyway, right? Like, but you know, Maybe they I just digress. thought it was more so, impressive to, to put it back in the fridge. In some ways, it's, it's more And they couldn't think impressive. it was more impressive. Like if they are, they're, they're again, morons, right? Like it's just <laughs> ridiculously stupid. Um, but, but trying to make digital versions or virtual versions of what you've done already is just the most obvious way to make dumb new things. Like that's just not what tends to work, you know? Like it's just... It's a new angle, a new thing, a new possibility, a new convenience, not just replicating um, what we did. And, and it seems so obvious when you say it out loud, but you know, it, it'd be the equivalent of when we introduced non-linear editing, like in Avid days, that you would have a little digital cutter that would cut the digital film and then you'd have, but having said that, you know, when Avid came out, they had bins which is what you used to have for hanging up bits of film in. That was just, I think, as I say, trying to connect a mental model that you'd understand what it was. But the physicality of it, trying to mirror that is nuts. Um, yeah, it's not the thing that you want. You want to have the new opportunities and you need to think about the affordances granted by the environment that you're in and the possibilities, the potentials uh, that that offers to the user rather than recreating stuff from the past or from a, a physical world. I will point out all this. So, so the AI stuff that we've been discussing and that I, you know, kind of keen on, like a really big aspect about that is it's not digitization. If you want to ask yourself whether the AI stuff is hype or not, and it isn't, but if you want to ask yourself that, it's the same question I always ask about stuff. Is this a digitization of something that we did before or is it something new? And you can't say that the machine learning stuff is a digitization. It's actually a new thing. So it's potentially very, very powerful. Just digitizing a process is what we've been doing for the last 30 years, taking something and making it digital, right? I no longer have to have a actual ticket from the ticket machine when I go into the car park because it just looks at my number plate and then I have a digital ticket effectively, right? That's a digitization of a process. Now it might use machine learning to read my number plate, but that's not the point. It's just a digitization. It's just that used to be a physical ticket. Now there's a digital ticket. I've digitized the process. What we're doing with machine learning um, when we're coming up with some of these uh, things, well, like in my case of the champion that 
we did with Adapt and Pin Screen, like that's not a digitizing of the film process. The film process is already digital, right? Um, the dubbing, you know, already involved digital sound files. That's not digitizing it. It is actually changing something. Ergo, it's new and therefore it's got legs and has real potential. Uh, some things may wither on the vine still. That's not, you know, say everything that's AI is going to work, but it's not just a, uh, an incremental, if you like, digitization process. And so digitizing walking around a supermarket with a trolley, this doesn't get me out of bed. No. But you can see shops where where it would make sense, where a clothes shop, where if you had a scan model of yourself, you could actually see what you look like in the various clothes. Um, or if you if you had an Ikea and you had a digital model of your house and you could put the furniture in your digital house without having to sh take it home and build it, um, those would be kind of useful things that might add something to the, to the experience. Because there's enormous benefit in digital clothes, right? You could, if you're buying online, it's the size problem, right? The, the economics of digital humans in fashion is enormous. And part of it is just reducing returns. So if I, and which is the case with some apps already, right? I can see a pair of shoes and I can just point them at my own feet and it'll show me what they would look like on my feet, right? And then, uh, Yo-Yo Town in Japan and stuff does amazing stuff with like being able to digitize your own feet and yourself so that you can get exactly the right sizes. And all of that is financially viable because they just reduce returns. And in the fashion industry, returns is incredibly expensive cost of doing business. They have to have returns or you won't buy online, but like it's just dead. It's dead for shipping. It's dead for what happens when that inventory gets back, whether they can reuse it or not. Um, I know stories of people buying TVs and they were faulty and they were like, well, I would like a new one. They're like, sure, we'll send you a new one. And they're like, do you want this one back? And they're like, no, because what are we going to do with it? We're going to pay you to ship it to us. And then what are we going to do? It's faulty. We're going to just throw it out. And then we have to pay to throw it out. So we'd much prefer you just to keep it. <laughs> and that to me is insane, right? But think about the cost if that's not a faulty thing, but just something I don't like because it doesn't fit. And so, um, yeah, the economics of... And also just the quality of materials, like knowing how they would flow, whether or not they hang or they, uh, like I like shirts that are good, a bit stiffer so that I don't like kind of a super low cotton thing. Uh, that's just my preference. I just think that it looks better on me. That's got nothing to do with anyone else. Just, well, maybe my wife, but you know, apart from that, it's like, I just don't like it. So when I'm buying a shirt, it matters to me the weight of the fabric. It's very hard to tell that from a photo, but you can tell it when they actually have a photo of a, a real person. But I would love to be able to have, you know, more information about the weight and the structure of the material and how it move. And you can't get that from a still. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a lot, but I, I would argue again, this is not digitization. It's not doing a digital, it's not a digital sort of parallel. Um, it's actually providing something new that you couldn't otherwise do, which is I could understand the nature of a fabric while being 300 miles away from the fabric. I mean, you're, you're, at that point, you're uh, actually simming cloth on, on yourself, which is, you know, I mean, in terms of the level, the volume of customers you'd be doing. And this was another thing I was going to ask about, because it is a kind of connection perhaps between AI and some of the AR stuff is, economically you know metaverse is website money but in order to be attractive you're looking at like almost aa games in terms of the environments and, and so forth and a lot of things that exist in aa games which cost a huge amount of money to produce but at the same time you're looking at trying to create it at the cost of a of a website maybe an expensive website if you're talking about amazon Maybe not so much if it's a, a local business. So you're concerned about the economics of the metaverse, as in whether I can produce that level of quality at that. But I mean, I'm not a fan that there is going to be a metaverse that I go to, right? Like, I think that's not what the metaverse is. Um, and I don't think that's what we're approaching I think that's exactly what I was talking about before, which is some imagining of the current thing, then just moved into some digitized version of it. My metaverse is uh, 
I want a digital human slash co-pilot slash assistant that is with me in multiple locations and has a and has memory. So it understands me, it understands where I've been and what I've done, and it contextualizes any response accordingly. And it doesn't just start from scratch when it asks any question. Um, and I want to be able to do things that I can't do previously in a digital twinning sense, not in a um, going into some virtual poker room to play poker with my virtual friends, which is sort of the demo I think that they had at Meta. And now Meta does exceptionally good digital human work. Don't get me wrong, they really got some of the best researchers in the world, really, really great. But some of their demos are just so dumbass in terms of like the conceptualization of that technology. I mean, no one in their right mind is gonna go into some VR space with their mates all going into some VR space and pay poker with them. Like it's just the, the, almost the definition of being a loser, right? You're like sitting alone in your bedroom in your underpants, like in sticking a VR thing on going to some, like it's just not gonna happen. And also, you know, yeah, and don't get me started. But, but what I do think is gonna happen and very, very soon is that we're gonna start having really interesting volumetric capture spaces. And so we'll be able to gather a whole lot of volumetric information using machine learning and, and other techniques, NERFs and other things, so that we can digitize where I am in a uh, sense that then allows it to be volumized and done over time. And then the experience of that would be, you would look at it on your iPhone or iPad, and as you move your iPhone or iPad, it moves the view. So I would, you know, you know if I was a parent, I would do this of my kid's birthday party, and then the grandparents could watch that back. But if some child's in the way of seeing the candles being blown out, they would just move their head or their their iPhone to the left and they'd see around the child that was blocking the view, right? Now, that's sensible to me. And it's also a business model that's sensible because everybody has mobile phones or iPads or whatever. And that could obviously be made by Google, but you know, I'm just gonna use that term. And, and they are gonna be able to experience that way. They're not gonna be spending an extra $1,200 buying goggles, they're just gonna use whatever they already have, but experience it volumetrically. But there will be a whole new breed of VFX artists and people making those things. So like a store, a bike store, whatever, might have a whole lot of volumetric work done by a crew, which you'd normally call a video crew or a film crew, but that crew would make all that, that volumetric stuff up for the company that would then allow Joe Consumer uh, or Jane to come along and sort of experientially more reasonably understand the goods and what was going on in the store. And that's why I'm a big advocate of saying that really soon now, companies like Apple will release expensive tools for the volumetric capture and creation and stuff, but they won't be making glasses, goggles and VR headsets because that end of it just doesn't have legs, right? It's there are corporate applications of stuff, but Magic Leap. I mean, I you know, uh, I I had Magic Leap. I mean, I understood the technology was very excited about it because of its uh, VR overlay potential. But still, like it's just really unreasonable at the moment to expect people are going to go, oh, quick, run in the other room, get out all this kit, switch it on, calibrate it, run it pop it in unless it's uh entertainment at a like a venue or it's gaming like hardcore gaming yeah no problem right you can come up with some really good games that are like that but leaving that aside for a second you know and i know one on a date with a partner wants to like have them sit in another chair unable to see you with some goggles on i mean it's just nuts right um but how cool would it be if you were second uh, screening the Super Bowl and you on your phone could be zooming around and zooming in to see something because you were more interested in what was happening in your team than the coverage of the Super Bowl, which was showing you the main play from the obvious vantage point that was of interest to the majority of viewers. But on my second screen, I was able to like, at the same time, zoom down in and like check out what was going on with the other teams, you know, blindside or whatever. I, I don't know American football well enough to give you a good example here, but uh, 
uh, in soccer, right? Like I might be interested in the in my um, goalkeeper, and because I just think this guy's awesome. But the players at the other end of the field, and I'm just curious what's happening at the other end of the field, and that would be a good second screen experience for me to be able to do that. Now, you wouldn't don the headgear and all that stuff to do that. You'd simply, you know, uh, and there are some other really good examples. Uh, there's a very new hardly talked about short on uh on disney only in america where at various points in the short uh, and it has blair larson and like from you know plays captain marvel but at, at various points in the thing things come out of your screen so if you're holding your iphone up pointing at your own telly yeah there's like a waterfall that spills out of the screen onto the floor of your own living room right and then trees start growing in your living room now you only see that if you point your iphone towards where the tree is but like how cool is that right so you're sitting there and the story's going on but things are literally leaving the screen and flying around your living room and that would completely match with how my daughters watch television which they always have a tv show on that they want and their friggin' iphones out at the same time um that's the vr metaverse that i'm interested in and i think is commercially viable and that is technically and economically viable to do to your point about um triple a games right because that tree growing and the waterfall coming out and maybe it's i'm watching i don't know and or which this isn't that was reality i'm now speculating if i'm watching and or season three that you know the jet fighters or whatever are in my room and then go over the top of my head and into the screen like that would be super cool right um and you can imagine really good surround sound on a home system where you'd hear that there was a tank off to the right and it's not on the screen yet but if you had your second phone you'd pan around to the right and say oh my god there's a tank coming from the left i can see that right that's that's engaging that's cool that's interesting and i think that'll be what it's what the metaverse is but it'll probably be called something not metaverse just to get over the stigma that'll be attached to <laughs> annoying futurists talking about the metaverse in a way that causes us all to just feel kind of ill <laughs> brilliant um so i think uh, this has been a great chance to speak to you finally and like get this um and go through a lot of a lot of topics there's actually quite a few more topics i'd want to start but i think that could that could run into a whole nother episode I think we're out of time yeah yeah so um is there anything you wanted to just um, say as a kind of wrap up um, as in conclusion I guess there's only one point I would make and and it's really to th sort of thank you and people that are doing this discussion the thing about AI and a lot of the stuff with visual effects is that there are going to be bad uses of them and there are going to be disrespectful uses of them the biggest uh, tool we have in our arsenal to fight bad actors using this stuff is to have a really uh, educated and literate population so uh, my lab, the MODIS lab at uh, the University of Sydney, where we do research, we spend a lot of time doing what you might saw like community outreach, not like your listeners are professionals, um, but beyond professionals to kind of like more just interested people in the community, because a lot of this stuff is really important that we discuss. And, and if we don't discuss it, people are going to either take advantage of people or just, you know, do things that are wrong. So it is really important that there be like an active conversation in these uh, spaces. So that's why I was really keen to do the, the talk with you. Um, the more that we can have these discussions and come to an agreement on what is the right behavior when using these new technologies, I think the better off we will be. Fantastic. I think that's a really good place to close the discussion and we'll look forward to seeing the reaction to this and um, seeing what's happening next. We'll put links in the description to everything we've discussed and and a few more things and thank you very much mm -hmm.